Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Welcome to this evening's Thoughtful Thursday. I'm Lori Cameron, and on behalf of the Library Program Planning Committee, I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's talk by Dr. Frederick Silverblatt, who will give us a lot of very important and timely information about Lyme disease. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have an event coming up on Sunday, June the 9th, at the library. Um, if I can get her name correct. Amy Kurtz Lansing of the Florence Griswold Museum will discuss art and the New England farm, which should be very interesting. That will be at 5 o'clock on Sunday, June the 9th, here at the library. Dr. Frederick Silverblatt is an infectious disease specialist who focuses on tick-borne illnesses, including Lyme disease, infections of the lung, urinary tract, skin, bones, and joints. Graduate of New York University School of Medicine, he has been a practicing physician since 1970. And I will add that in his copious free time, he has managed to train for and participate in many marathons and triathlons over the years. I tell what great shape he's in. <laughs> he is currently an emeritus professor at the Alfred School of Medicine at Brown University and Chief of the Lyme Clinic at South County Health in East Greenwich, Rhode Island. He will discuss Lyme disease, including risk factors and treatment options, as well as newer diseases and research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Silverblatt. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I must say, uh, you're all fortunate to live in a very, very beautiful uh, part of the New England. Uh, have to come back. Uh, having discovered this. The only correction I'd make is that I started practicing in 62. Oh. I'm 80 years old, 82 years old. <laughs> All right, I'd like to present, present um, a case, kind of give you a flavor for uh, what Lyme disease uh, can do. Um, uh, 82 year old male was admitted to the emergency department with increasing confusion and fever to 103. He lives in a tick infested area. He had speech and motor difficulties and cognitive impairments. Can you hear me? All right, can you? Blood tests were positive for Lyme disease and babesiosis. He was hospitalized for three weeks, including one week of physical and cognitive therapy. He received one month of intravenous ceftriaxone for the Lyme and two weeks of azithromycin and a tovacone for babesiosis. He recovered completely and did a triathlon six months later. So I guess you can guess who that was. <laughs> and the reason I point this out is that as sick as I was, Lyme is treatable, mostly, and you catch it early. Okay, so here I am crossing the finish line at the World Championship uh, Half Ironman in Mount Tremblant. I finished third at that wow, good for you. Um, we were discussing about whether this is going to be a uh, bad tick season. I think that always comes up, and this was an article in the uh, New York Times, I believe, uh, which shows a little uh, white-footed mouse, which is the, uh, as innocent and uh, cute as it looks like, it's actually the, the villain in the piece over here. It's a major source of, uh, of Lyme disease. So, a little bit about ticks. Ticks are arthropods, they're not insects. They have eight legs like spiders as opposed to six legs of, uh, of insects. And different ticks 
carry different diseases. So it's very important to be able to recognize uh, uh, what tick is crawling on you or on your, your dog. This is a, 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 a can you see the, the, the uh, all right, we have to dim the lights or anything like that? We're good? Okay, so this is a female uh, adult uh, deer tick. It goes by different names. Um, I like black legged tick, black legged tick, because that's a very important point for uh, recognizing that species as opposed to wood ticks and, and other uh, common local ticks. So this is another tick which you probably are familiar with. This is the dog tick. It's much bigger. It's the one that has those big gray slug-like uh, blood-filled uh, uh, stomachs uh, uh, after they feast it on your dog's uh, blood. Rarely uh, bites uh, human uh, disease. It can carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but that is exceedingly rare in this uh, part of the, the country. I think it's one in a million population, but this is one of the ticks that, that can carry Rocky Mountain <coughs> spotted fever. Here's another tick which we're going to be talking about in greater detail. It's called the Lone Star Tick. It's called that way because it has a white uh, star, so-called, on the back. and. Um, it's previously not very common around here, but it's uh, as climate changes, it m it's moving up the coast uh, from its normal habitat, which is the uh, uh, central uh, part of the country and the southeast, and we're beginning to see these ticks. In fact, I think I had a patient who came from Stonington who told me that she saw one of these ticks around here. We'll talk more about that because it carries different diseases. <coughs> Here's a, a, an important slide that shows the relative size of these ticks. On the top is, uh, are the deer ticks, and um, uh, you can see the different stages that the ticks have to go through in order to mature. On the right is a little tiny uh, larva. It hatches out of the eggs and then molts after the first year into a nymph. And then these are the adults. And here are the equivalent uh, stages of the dog tick. And the lo this is the lone star tick, and this is the dog tick. So they're relatively small. And of them, the uh, deer tick is the uh, smallest. Okay. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes on the life cycle of the ticks, because it, uh, it has a lot of information uh, about uh, when to worry about being bitten by a tick, when, which ticks you need to worry about. And let's just start at the top. In the springtime, the adults lay eggs, and they then hatch in about a month into the, uh, into the larva. Larvas will not, do not carry Lyme disease. The, uh, the uh, female, if she has Lyme disease, does not transmit the, the illness in the eggs. So a, a larva is not going to um, uh, infect you until it, ca it has a blood meal from an animal that does have Lyme disease, in which case it could then um, uh, cause Lyme disease if it bites you. But that's very unusual. They don't mature, they don't have that first blood meal until the summertime. So around this time, we're mostly concerned about the nymphs and the adult uh, females. So let's just carry along here. The larva feeds, usually uh, small animals, uh, raccoons, rabbits, and again, our friend, the white-footed uh, mouse. The larva then goes dormant during the fall and the winter. They love to, ne uh, to nest or to winter over in piles of leaves, and I'm going to be mentioning that again. I got that Lyme disease because I was messing around in my uh, garden in a, pit, in a uh, pile of leaves from the uh, previous winter. So that's, if you're going to get bitten uh, in your garden, that's probably where it's going to be. All right, so the uh, following along in uh, the uh, second year, the uh, uh, mints, I'm assuming the larva molt, and they go to the form, which is called a nymph. 
they then have to take a blood meal. In order to go uh, to the next stage, like pass and go, collect $200, they then, uh, when, after they have their a blood meal, they can then become the, the next more mature form. And here we're talking about uh, humans getting involved, um, and pets, and again our friend the white-footed mouse. They then turn into um, uh, adults. I must say, I've never uh, seen a male on me. They're more interested in chasing after the females. <laughs> so if you're going to pull a tick off of a deer tick, it's most commonly uh, this adult female. The hallmark is this reddish-orange uh, back part of their uh, carapace. Now, up to now we haven't talked about deer. So it turns out that deer do not transmit Lyme disease. It's the mouse that does. And the role of the deer is to provide some substance, I don't think we know what it is, which enables the, the adults to become fertile. If you don't have a deer, they don't uh, lay eggs, and you don't have any ticks the next, next year. So uh, uh, the uh, deer um, provide that vital information, and then we go around again um, a year. Ticks can live up to three years uh, with this cycle. Okay, moving along. So um, I'm going to uh, <coughs> condense this slide. Um, some ticks with some uh, illnesses, the female can pass along the bacteria. So the nymphs of that particular, uh, with that particular disease, can go through the um, uh, through the egg stage, and the, and the, the nymphs can become infected. So if they land on you, they spend about, uh, um, well, let me back up again. So they, they spend about 90% of the time um, unattached from the house, uh, from the host, looking for a host in which to, to, to bite. They are seasonally active, and as I mentioned, they lived up to uh, three years. They have very highly uh, specialized mechanisms for sensing the uh, uh, warm-blooded animal to take a, a, a blood meal. They can uh, sense the carbon dioxide that we exhale. They can sense the vibrations of our feet as we get closer. They can detect the warmth of a warm-blooded animal. So they're very, very good at, at what they're uh, trying to do. So they have two host-seeking behaviors, uh, ambush and hunt. I think the hunts are probably uh, for the small animals. They, they're not really very fast moving, but they can cover some territory and, and uh, catch up, especially if a small animal is, uh, is uh, not moving very much. More commonly, they are uh, ambushing. So they will get to a, a place where uh, they can climb up. It's particularly important for deer because deer are bigger, as, as are we, and probably uh, better to uh, attach them in a larger portion of their, of their body. Here's a tick waiting on a, a leaf grass for, uh, for a meal to come along. So once they get on you, they wander around for several hours before uh, uh, attaching. Uh, they prefer warm, moist parts of the body, uh, for example, the back of the knee or the armpit. But they can, they can attach anywhere. So sometimes they'll be in the scalp and you won't see the rash because of, because of hair. Sometimes they'll be in the back uh, where you don't normally uh, uh, look for them. Um, in order to accomplish this feed, they have additional mechanisms to evade your being aware of them or doing anything about it. So if you think about it, what does a tick have to do, a little tiny tick, in order to accomplish, a, get a blood meal? Well, one thing, they have to uh, inject a little uh, anesthetic so you're not even aware that they're there. You all, they also inject uh, cement so they don't, uh, don't fall off easily. We'll talk about how to remove a tick in a little bit. And um, they also need to inject an anticoagulant because the, the blood cannot clot uh, for them to be able to, uh, to, to drink it. So 
they've got other uh, different secretions in their saliva that they use to uh, uh, successfully take a blood meal. Here's a very important point. I, by the way, I've mentioned the points that I want you to, to take home. Little feeding occurs between uh, 20, uh, uh, between 24 and 36 hours. They may be on you, they may be embedded, but they're not feeding, and then because they're not feeding, they're also not injecting the uh, bacteria into you. So, if you recognize the tick, I'm allergic to the ticks, and so I start scratching, and um, I feel a little something there that's not supposed to be there, and I'll look down, and I'll say, oh, yeah, there's a tick. And I'm, so, I'm lucky, but many people are not allergic to them, and um, you need to, if you've been exposed to a tick, it's very important, in, in, if you've been exposed in an area where the ticks are, are pre uh, prevalent, inspect yourself. And then take a shower, and you can wash off the ticks if they're not, um, they're not already embedded, and look around, look in the mirror, have your significant other look at the other parts of your body. Uh, because it's very important uh, to take the ticks off within that early time period. Uh, well, that's a scary picture of the front end of a tick. <laughs> so, um, so what, what, how did Lyme get started? You know, there's a, a urban myth that it was an island off of the co coast of Lyme, Connecticut. There was a, this is true, uh, an army biological warfare uh, unit and that the soldiers, the chemists were playing around with a new biological warfare and then they invented, I'm saying this as a myth, they invented uh, uh, Lyme disease and somehow it got over and into Lyme, Connecticut or maybe somebody did some mischief and introduced it to the population. Nice story. I mean, it's like most of these paranoid uh, fantasies, if there's a kernel of truth, and that is that there is a biological warfare out there. But we know that Lyme has been around for a long time. If you take samples of blood, people uh, that gave it um, in the 20s and even earlier, and you test for Lyme, you can find Lyme disease there. And Lyme is actually present in, um, uh, in, in Europe and in Eurasia. Different species of different variety, but it causes basically the same illness. So what happened? Why are we suddenly aware of Lyme disease? Why did it take so long for Alan Steer, who was a, a, a rheumatologist in a, a juvenile rheumatoid arthritis clinic, to realize that this is something strange, something people are not aware of, and um, discovery of, of Lyme disease? Well, it has to do with um, uh, World War II. So in World War II, after World War II, there were a lot of veterans that came back and they wanted to have their house of their own, the little uh, American dream. And so the developers obligingly cut down the forest and had all these levitowns towns and all these other um, uh, places, uh, beautiful places, nice gardens, things like that. But what, what they didn't realize they were doing was they were increasing the feeding area for deer. Uh, white-footed, I mean, yeah, white-tailed deer, excuse me, white-tailed deer uh, like to browse on the edges of forests, nice tender shrubs and things like that. And all these subdivisions created many more places where they could browse and the, and the uh, population is, has exploded for white-tailed deer. Where I live, there's a constant battle of, between the people say, oh, they're so cute, mm -hmm. and, uh, they, and they are cute, and the babies are cute, and those of us who have had Lyme disease and want to manage the herd, you know, cut it down a little bit. Okay, so uh, we talked about that, and this is just a slide showing you what's happened to Lyme disease with the increase in the number of deer. Uh, it is uh, in 2001, you can see on the left, the pockets of Lyme disease are uh, the, along the Atlantic coast, mostly in New England, and then there's another area in the upper Midwest. And in 2015, you can see how much more prevalent Lyme disease and, and how many more areas it's, um, it's covering. 
It's the most common vector-borne disease in the, in the country. Vector-borne means that it's something that carries it from one species to another. In this case, it's the ticks. In this case, it's the mice. All right, so Lyme disease is um, uh, very much like a, another organism in the same group of bacteria, spiral-shaped bacteria, as syphilis. And like syphilis, it has three stages. There's an early localized stage around where the bite occurs. It then gets into the bloodstream and disseminates particular parts of the body. And then if it's not treated and identified, uh, it can persist and cause uh, late stage uh, uh, disease. We'll talk about each of those. So the first stage is the rash. And it begins as a little bump, a little papule and it rapidly expands, and uh, symptoms usually going along with that are fever, flu-like symptoms, fatigue, joint pains, the joint pains are migratory, you have elbow pain for one day and knees the next day. You don't actually have arthritis, it's just pains in those joints. And you can, like, like other kinds of infections, you can have swollen glands in that area. Um, um, Here's a picture of the typical, or I should say the classical, uh, bullseye rash. Most people don't get this. I didn't get this when I had Lyme disease. Mostly it looks like this. It's confluent. It's, it's uh, no target-like um, uh, uh, appearance. It's not painful. It's not, not itchy. So it can... It can persist unrecognized, especially if it's in areas that you normally can't see or don't see. And it goes away by itself. So that's, that's the, the difficulty with this. So many people will have the later stages and didn't realize they were bitten by a tick. Um, I would have to say, if you get a flu-like illness and you don't have a cold or diarrhea, in the, in the right time, so now and through the summer, um, you have to think about it about Lyme disease because that's uh, that can very well. Uh, it's more likely in he around here. The doctors at uh, in, in my hospital, if somebody comes in with a fever and fatigue and joint pains, flu-like symptoms, and there's no other signs of a virus, they will uh, test for Lyme and treat Lyme, treat for Lyme empirically. Okay. So, like I said, it spreads from, uh, from that first uh, bullseye or, or, or red area uh, to different parts of the body. One place it can spread to is the skin. So you, uh, you can have multiple areas of these uh, red oval shape or round shaped or target shaped uh, lesions. Quite striking when somebody comes in with uh, with these, with these uh, lesions all over. Um, another place it can go to uh, is uh, uh, the joints. Now this is uh, now a uh, more of an arthritis. It can get swollen and tender. More seriously, you can go to the brain, which is what I had. I had encephalitis. It can go to the meninges, the lining of the brain and spinal cord, so-called meningitis. It can go to the nerves uh, in the extremities, causing numbness and tingling and pain. And uh, it can also go to the heart. I think this is the only way in which you can die of, of Lyme disease. It affects the conduction system. So you have heart block. So again, if somebody uh, comes in with uh, a young person comes in, you shouldn't have heart block. And the EKG is taken and they can see that the the, uh, uh, the propagation of the, uh, uh, the stimulus uh, that's supposed to go all the way down and cause the contraction, it stops somewhere. Uh, that's highly suggestive in the right setting of uh, Lyme disease. Treatable, uh, and most of the time um, it is treated. I don't think I've heard of anybody that dying with Lyme disease, but conceivably, conceivably you can. Oh, one point I wanted to make, it's, uh, not, it's not in the handout. The interval between these stages are such that people may not 
remember they had Lyme disease or they were not aware of it. And so it's, um, it's a bit of a puzzle if somebody comes in with arthritis to, uh, to realize that it's Lyme disease, the right test, and, and give the right treatment. So the, all these things take uh, weeks or months between the different uh, steps. <clears throat> so this is a picture of somebody that has involvement of the seventh nerve, and it causes uh, uh, Bell's palsy, fa facial weakness on one side of the, the body or another. <clears throat> Around here, this is a very common cause of Bell's palsy. The other common cause is uh, herpes virus. Um, I had a poor, poor lady that had it bilaterally. She had it both sides. I saw her, this was a number of years ago, I saw her, she was completely cured. So I was uncomfortable while she had it, but that's it. So uh, let's go to the third stage. <coughs> this is late Lyme, um, and it can cause memory def deficits, irritability, uh, sleepliness. You can have severe arthritis and the uh, peripheral neuropathy, the numbness of the tingling of the extremities. Now, um, uh, this is treatable as well. You need to uh, identify it, and, uh, and tr the treatment is a little bit different, and I'll get to that there when we get to that. There's a picture of somebody with a swollen knee, and um, it's also they don't have a history of uh, athletics or arthritis or something. Most orthopedists around here will think about Lyme disease. Oops, sorry, going the wrong way. All right, now I want to introduce one of the uh, um, one of the, the chronic, semi-chronic conditions that can follow Lyme disease, and that is about 10 percent of the population who have classic Lyme. Uh, treated with the right antibiotic will continue to have symptoms afterwards. And a lot of doctors are not aware of this uh, phenomena. The bugs are dead, but the inflammation that the infection sets up is persisting. So they can still have joint pains. They can still have foggy brain. They can still have fatigue. But since the bugs are dead, you don't need to treat it with a second or a third course of of uh, antibiotics. This is a problematic condition because there really is no specific treatment. Treatment is, is um, um, uh, symptomatic. So uh, interestingly, they're fatigued, but one of the things that, that helps is uh, exercise. Graded exercise, <coughs> not going out and running a marathon, but doing what you can do and then gradually increasing it. Um, it, you, it, it always goes away. I shouldn't say it usually goes away. Sometimes it could take up to a year, uh, but, it, but people will appreciate that getting better um, you know, progressively. And the treatment, as I mentioned, is symptomatic, uh, the, uh, antidepressants for, for depression, stimulus, and maybe some Adderall for the fatigue, uh, Lyrica or uh, Gabapentin, uh, for the um, pains, and there's a psychological uh, technique called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, it's a way of breaking the cycle of, uh, of uh, feeling bad, sorry for yourself, and it enhances all these symptoms. So it's a very useful technique for, for this condition. All right, let's talk a little bit about Lyme, um, Lyme tests. Another very controversial subject. The usual method for diagnosing Lyme is to do a two-step test. And I emphasize this two-step test because <coughs> some doctors will skip the first test, and that's wrong. So what this test is not, doesn't test for the presence of the bacteria. It's not like if you have a urinary tract infection, you can culture E. coli out of the urine. This looks for the immune response to the infection. It's the basis of a lot of tests for infectious diseases. So if you get an infection, Lyme, measles, whatever, the body fights it by making antibodies. So this test detects these anti-Lyme antibodies. And this first 
parts, it's a two-step test. First part looks for the amount of antibodies. And um, it's, a, it's a quantitative test. And because there are, can be false positives, there are other bacteria similar to Lyme disease that can elicit an immune response that the test picks up as a false positive. It's not Lyme. They go on to, to do the second test, and that's something called a Western blot. Familiar with these terms? Have you? Yeah. Okay. So what is the Western blot? It looks for more specific parts of the Lyme bacteria. So that it's, um, what they do is they take the bacteria, they digest it, and they put it on what's called an electrophoresis, and it separates into bands, different parts, different size molecules, basically. And then they overlay uh, the uh, person's serum on this, and they have a way of detecting to which bands will be recognized. Sorry about that. That's all right. Happened to me a little bit earlier. <laughs> so um, uh, then they count the bands. And if you have more than five bands, the first part is a true positive. It's a way of saying whether the first part is true positive or a false positive or not. Some doctors will go directly to the Western blot. And yes, that will pick up the fact that a person has had Lyme disease. It's very, very sensitive. It might detect Lyme you had when it was your child, but it has nothing to do with what's going on uh, right now. So it's, it's wrong to just do the, uh, the Western blot. Okay. The other thing I uh, want to point out is that if you go to the doctor with a Lyme rash or something that is, uh, like I showed you over there, um, the test is more than likely to be negative because it takes a while for the body to generate these anti-Lyme, these uh, Lyme antibodies. And so some doctors will say, you don't have Lyme disease, the test was negative. Wrong. If you retest in another couple of weeks, the test will become positive. So my recommendation when I give this talk to doctors is treat, symptom, treat empirically if you suspect Lyme from the clinical uh, um, findings. Somebody comes in with a target lesion, you don't need to go any further than that. I wouldn't even do the test. That's Lyme disease. But there are a lot of cases where somebody's coming in with a, a, a fever and a flu-like illness and they don't have any reason to have that at the right time in the right place that may very well may be a tick-borne illness. And so I would treat and then you could, if you want to be sure you can always draw the test um, a little bit later when it's positive. The other thing is that uh, the Lyme antibody uh, can persist for a long time. Sometimes people will have it all their life. Most of the time it goes away by about a, a year. But some people will always turn positive, and then they will um, they will have their te their Lyme test done by a doctor for for some reason, and it's positive. And um, then what do you do with that information? Uh, what I recommend is if, if the person doesn't sound like they have Lyme disease, test them again, and it's likely that uh, that that it will probably still be positive and will not really change very much over that period of time. Okay, so this is what a Western blot looked like, and you can see the bands over here, and they count them, and if it's five or more, then that's true positive. So, what about if the test is negative? The thing you have to realize is that this is not a magic test. There, it's only 70% sensitive. So there are 30% of people who will have Lyme disease and the test is negative. And that really is a problem. The test is not any better or worse than other tests for infectious diseases, but it does present a problem for doctors and for, for, for patients. So they do have Lyme, but the test is negative. Um, there are newer tests coming out. Uh, one that I use is something called a Lyme 6 peptide. It's another part of the Lyme that they use for the test, same kind of test looking for the antibodies, but it seems to be more sensitive. And I've had people, uh, just the other day, somebody came in with symptoms that really sounded like Lyme, did the Lyme test, 
uh, and it was negative. I said, let's do this newer test, and it was positive. And then I could go on and treat her uh, you know, with confidence that I knew that she did have Lyme. Uh, there are other bacteria that cause Lyme-like symptoms, and we'll get to some of those, the relatives of the, of the Lyme bacteria. They will not turn positive. It's a, it's a bacteria called Miamatoi. I'll talk more about that. Um, that it doesn't test positive there, uh, for, for Lyme. You can do other tests specifically, but you have to think about it. And there are other... Um, Let's, let's uh, go on for that. Um, so, uh, again, clinical symptoms are, I think, um, as important or more important than the results of the test at all. Okay, let's talk about treatment of Lyme. I like this slide. Get it? Doxycycline? <laughs> we had doxies. I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist putting this in. Here. Okay, so most Lyme is treated with doxycycline. Uh, it seems like most tick-borne illnesses are treated with doxycycline. And it's 100 milligrams twice a day for 10, between 10 and 21 days. You don't need to give two months or even a month. Actually, uh, I usually give 14 days. Uh, because, as you'll see, that doxycycline is good for other tick-borne illnesses, and you don't always know that the tick has actually given you two or three different illnesses. So, uh, 14 days will probably get the, you get them all. If you can't tolerate doxycycline, and a lot of people can't, um, it's kind of hard on your stomach. Uh, you can use amoxicillin um, or or a cephalosporin uh, called. Uh, Septin, and those are equally um, as effective. All right, let's talk about uh, the late stage, remember the, the, the third stage of Lyme disease. If you have neurological symptoms, which I had, it may require intravenous uh, antibiotics. And uh, the one we use is ceftriaxone, that's the one I had. And that's usually for a month. That requires putting in something called a PIC. Familiar with that? It's a very, very long IV. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that you can actually give yourself. And my, my wife gave it to me. She's a dancer and she had no problems giving it. It's not, a, not an intimidating process at all. Um, uh, Lyme arthritis usually responds to one or two rounds of, of doxycycline. This time it's, it's for a month. And if the person does not get better, this is late stage, big sausage-shaped knees, painful, um, then you, need, you might need to require the same IV uh, treatment with, dox with uh, ceftriaxone. All right, now for something completely different, as Monty Python used to say, mm -hmm. Ehrlichia. This is another tick-borne illness. Actually, the, the, uh, deer, the deer tick carries up to nine different infections. Six are seen in the New England. This is a bacteria, it's not the, not the Lyme bacteria, it's something that lives in the cells called anaplasma, the one that's found here. Some people use the term Ehrlichia for that, but it's a, this the real name is anaplasma. It infects white blood cells. There's another kind of same family of, of Ehrlichia that's uh, carried by the Lone Star tick. I'll get to that in a few minutes. And that infects a different white blood cell. The symptoms are fever, fatigue, muscle weakness, and pains. Similar treatment, doxycycline. And this is what, if you looked in a microscope at a blood smear, this is a white blood cell. And you can see, here's the nucleus that's dark. This, this is a cluster of the bacteria inside. Sometimes the laboratory will, will call me and say, uh, you've got a patient who has a lichia. They'll make the diagnosis just by looking at the, at the blood smear. Okay, babesiosis. This is not a bacteria at all. This is a parasite. It's related to malaria, sort of the North American equivalent of, uh, of malaria. And this affects red blood cells. The ehrlichias affect the white blood cells. This affects the red blood cells causes the cells to burst open. 
carried by our friend the deer tick, black-legged tick, and uh, can be a co-infection. Up to 10% of people with Lyme will also have one of these other um, <coughs> tick-borne illnesses. This is um, um, uh, yet another one. I had that when I had my Lyme encephalitis. I also had uh, Babesia. It's a, light, it's a mild affection for most people, younger people. But it can be serious and it can be life-threatening. Life uh, the main uh, co uh, complication is anemia. And people that cannot, uh, for relig religious reasons, accept blood transfusions. I had a, a woman, actually, who died of anemia because she it was against her religion to get uh, blood transfusions. So it, it, can, it can be very serious, especially for people who are immune suppressed or who do not have a spleen. Somebody had their spleen taken out for one reason or another. Uh, they cannot fight the disease very well because the spleen is where uh, red blood cells who have the disease in them are plucked out of the bloodstream. Um, I had a patient who was a, a swimming um, body surfing and he took a particular hard hit and he ruptured his spleen. And uh, he was in the emergency room. Luckily, uh, one of our doctors uh, uh, realized that the ruptured spleen was, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So he came in with a ruptured spleen and it turns out that the reason he ruptured his spleen was because he had all these, inf these infected red blood cells. He had babesiosis. So now I have somebody who's got the babesiosis and no spleen. And it took um, him many, many courses of antibiotics uh, to get, get rid of these uh, babesia. Treatment is not doxycycline. And that's another take home uh, point. If, if you've, uh, somebody has Lyme disease and they, did, they don't get better, you've made the diagnosis and they're not getting better, think about babesia, because it can cause fever and, and uh, joint pains and fatigue and much of the same symptoms. These are pretty much not, uh, you can't always diagnose this on the basis of their symptoms. They're uh, non-selective. So anyway, um, in that case, if somebody doesn't get better, one of the things you should think about is they have another tick-borne illness in particular, but easier because you have to use different antibiotics, as uh, azithromycin and and an anti-malarial, this uh, tovaquone, uh, to cure it. And that's what the, again, if you're looking through the microscope, you'll see these little signet ring things in the red, in the, uh, in the red blood cells. And again, we get calls from the lab saying, got a case of Ibizia for you. All right, so now something you probably haven't heard very much about, uh, newer, Newer uh, tick-borne illnesses. That's the one thing I love about infectious diseases. There's always something new. <laughs> Every year, Zika. Um, you know, so now we have some new tick-borne illnesses. Uh, some of them are in, in, the, in the same family as, uh, as Lyme disease. The one I alluded to before, Borrelia miyamotoi, uh, sim similar symptoms to Lyme disease. It's not detected by Lyme tests. It does not have a rash. We discovered this in our own population uh, because the, um, the lab uh, had a, a, a deal with the reference lab that was doing our Lyme test. And they'll say, well, for a little bit more, we will also test for this organism, uh, Borrelia miyamotoi. And it turned out that there was like 7% of the people we thought had Lyme disease actually had this bacteria. Probably doesn't matter because if you give doxycycline, it, it, it gets better. And there's something called Borrelia mayonii, and this is, was discovered in the Mayo Clinic, and hence its name. The rash is like a measles-like rash, little red spots all over. Not yet in New England. I'm waiting for my first case. It's upper, upper Midwest. Remember, there was that other cluster of Lyme disease in <coughs> Michigan. And, Minnesota and those places. Uh, so we, I don't think we need to worry about this one uh, yet. It's also treated with doxycycline. Now, Powassan virus. Have you heard of this? 
made the news serious. This is a, uh, a, a encephalitis, and it's a virus. It's in the same family as Zika and West Nile, and it has a very high uh, mortality. 15% of people die, and 50% uh, of people will have lingering <coughs> neurological uh, deficits. We had two cases, one of whom died in, uh, in, um, uh, at South County Hospital. Remember I told you it takes a while for the tick to inject the bacteria if it's Lyme disease? This virus gets transmitted in 15 minutes. So it's a real bad actor. Luckily, it's very, very uncommon. So I think there may be 100 cases so far in New England. But we're on the lookout for it. No treatment. Now, some coming attractions. <laughs> Let's go back to our, our new friend, the Lone Star Tick. Remember I said it's coming up the, the coast uh, because the climate is warming up. Recognized by that white spot on the back. That's the adult, but all, all the forms have some sort of a white marking on, on the back. It can cause its own plethora of uh, a, a menu of, of different uh, illnesses. Um, ehrlichiosis, remember that's the one that's similar to our anaplasma, plasmosis. Fever, um, joint pains, muscle aches, fatigue. Uh, you need a separate test for that. And I think South County is now has a bundle of tick tests. And they look for all of these tests that we're talking about. So we will, we will recognize it um, if, if, if the person has it. Again, Doxycycline is uh, treated with it. Uh, here's a very interesting condition. It's called STARI, which sounds as, as stands for Southern Tick Associated Rath Rash Illness. What makes it um, uh, interesting is that it causes a bullseye rash. So here's another another uh, disease that's associated with what we used to think was only seen with. Uh, um, uh, with Lyme disease. It's a very mild illness, and usually in, in kids, we really don't know um, what causes it. Some people think it's another uh, bacteria similar to uh, Lyme disease. And the feeling is that you should try doxycycline and it probably works, but it pro goes away by itself. Now, have you heard about the uh, alpha-gal allergen? Don't read the New York Times. There's an article about that. This is the article about that. This is really scary. Funny, but it's scary. So it turns out that if you get bitten by this lone star tick, and I think you probably need to get bitten more than once, you become allergic to meat. And if you have a hamburger or um, a pork chop or lamb, any red meat, you get an allergic reaction. And that, vary, uh, that varies from inches and hives to anaphylaxis, life threatening. So um, I haven't seen a case of that yet, uh, but I think it's uh, becoming, uh, we'll probably hear more about it and, uh, and see more about it. I don't know what to, to tell you, just avoid lone star ticks. <laughs> okay, so why, why does this happen? Uh, Alpha-gal, that's the, the chemical name for a couple of the components, um, is a reaction to this substance, galactose, alpha-1,3-galactose, which is found in meat. Sensitization, sensitization rather, may occur after one or more bites by the long star tick. It's probably in the saliva of the tick. When he goes to take a, a meal, he probably injects this stuff, and some people get allergic to it. Uh, oh, sorry, it's found in the stomach in, of the tick and is regurgitated into the skin during taking a blood meal. And you can have, like I said, both a itchy rash and hives or else uh, um, anaphylaxis. And there's a list of the different things to run. So the reactions can be delayed for hours after exposure to meat. So you can go have a nice steak and not think anything about it and 
later that night come down with uh, with bitches. Oh, okay. So this is the last slide. Talk about scary. This is a, um, <laughs> it's a, this is a new tick from China. I don't know how it came to New Jersey, but it's killing sheep in New Jersey. Okay, native to China. It's called the Asian longhorn tick. I don't know where the horns are. It's got long front legs there. Native to China, first discovered in New Jersey in 2017, reported now in New York and Connecticut. Parasitizes cattle and sheep. In China, the longhorn species, or that's the Latin name, is known to transmit to humans a disease known as severe fever with thrombocytopenia. That means down, platelets are way down syndrome virus. The disease is estimated to kill 15% of the people uh, who um, are infected with it, probably. I don't think we need to worry about that just yet. But it's, um, you know, like all these things, they start in some Western country. Who ever worried about Ebola? Right? Or West Nile? Or Zika? But with all the transportation, ease of transmission, um, they can come. <coughs> All right, so let's talk now about uh, another seven minutes about preventing tick bites. After I've scared you all, now you want to rush out and, and buy what I'm going to try to sell you on. So the first thing is uh, wear long trousers that are tucked into boots. Try to get your teenage grandson to tuck his pants into his socks. Looks pretty nerdy. <laughs> Apply DEET, DEET rather, that's in the, the common insecticides, to your skin. Treat your clothing, and here's the main take, take, if I'm going to remember anything from this talk, it's going to be what I'm going to tell you right now. I wrote it down in this, uh, in that key points. <laughs> Treat your clothing, not your skin, with permethrin. It's a plant-derived chemical that kills ticks on contact. So you can Treat your clothing with it, let it dry. It's good for five or six washes, so you don't have to think about it every time you go into your garden. Just maybe dedicate some clothes that are treated when you're going to go out and weed, rake the leaves or whatever. And it really, really works. Uh, we have a, a, a largest garden, and uh, one spring morning, my wife and I uh, went out to look at the bulbs coming up, and we came back. She was wearing a white bathrobe. The hem was covered, must have been 50 ticks on the hem. And I said, let's see if this stuff works. So I took some of it down and I sprayed the hem and they all fell, fell off dead. It's a neurotoxin for the ticks. So DEET repels them, it's good, but this stuff actually kills them. And if you think about it, what do the ticks do? They land on your clothing and they crawl along looking for a sleeve or a cuff or something to get to your skin when they're in contact with the stuff on your, your clothing, <coughs> it's going to kill them. So that is really, really very important. The Army uses it uh, in Afghanistan and things like that. Um, and so where do you get this? Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You get everything on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to Dick's. I don't know, is there Dick's around here, Sporting yeah, yeah, Store? Yeah, yeah. That's where I get mine from. Cheap, 14 bucks for a bottle. You can buy pre-treated clothing. Good for 70 washes, probably the length of the of the of the of the clothing. Send your kids up to camp with these things, and um, uh, you don't have to worry about spraying it or anything like that. Um, okay, so that's uh, permethrin. Avoid piles of last year's leaves. Remember, I mentioned that did me in. Inspect your skin after exposure. I made that point already and protect your cats and your dogs. What I find is that the dog brings in the ticks. <laughs> and you know, before we get, get going and buy the first uh, tick collar or put uh, stuff on the back of the, of the neck. We're, we're going with these eight months, Soresto or something like that? They seem to work. But before we get around to doing it, the, ticks are, the, the dog is out in the, in, the, in the yard and comes in, jumps on the bed, and the next thing I know, I've got a tick on me. All right. Oh, here's the picture of the, the 
-hmm. trousers trucked underneath the uh, uh, socks. And here's a, a picture of the permethrin. Comes in the spray can. You see them spraying the shoes and the socks and pants and the shirt. <coughs> and that's a picture of the leaves up against the edge of the of the forest that you want to avoid. And that's the dog. So last, still got a couple of minutes. How do you remove a tick? You should not try the uh, old grandma method of putting a lit cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> the Ticks get very angry. <laughs> if they haven't already taken Stucky, they're going to do that. Um, and uh, you, you don't want to screw them out. They're not. It's the bacteria that are spiral shaped, not the ticks. So you, what you do is you you need to get some special uh, forceps. I think CVS. Um, um, you have a picture of this. Um, uh, CVS carries them. And you go down as close as you can to the head, grasp the, the, the head of the tick, and you firmly pull the tick outwards. Don't yank or twist or anything like that. You might leave the head in. It's not going to do anything that the tick hasn't already done. And uh, it's just going to come out like a splinter. So don't, don't be concerned about that. Okay, what do you do if you find an embedded tick? Um, you can do one of two things. You can watch and wait. You know where the tick uh, bit you, and you can watch for the bullseye or for the other rash. Oh, by the way, the other point about saying whether that's a Lyme rash or just an allergic reaction to the, uh, to the tick bite itself is the size. <coughs> Rashes from a tick are, you know, at least the size of a, uh, a, a big orange, I would say. So rashes that are from the, the allergy or the irritation from the bite, size of a quarter. So it's got to be big in order to count as a tick rash. All right, so you can watch and see if you, you get the, the rash uh, and, or fever, and then you can treat. Remember, treatment works. There's no resistance ticks to the antibody to doxycycline. Um, give t uh, doxycycline 100 milligrams uh, twice a day for 14 days, or <coughs> um, you can treat uh, with an antibiotic after the bite, not wait around for the rash to occur. A lot of people don't like to wait around and <coughs> wait for something bad to happen. They want to treat right away and get over with it. So a study was done which looked at the effectiveness of giving um, um, two, uh, 200 milligrams, that's two pills, right away, within 24 or 36 hours of having that bite. And it prevented uh, Lyme disease 87% of the time. So if, you, know, you can want, do one of two ways. Now, there's a bit of information you need to, to factor in when you're making that decision. A single bite from a tick, the chances that you're going to get uh, Lyme disease from that is 3%. So the odds are with you in any event. Don't panic. You know, don't uh, do anything rash, <laughs> unintended. Um, and, and so you could either wait, if you got the patients to do that, or you can take the uh, 200 milligrams right away. Now the trick is how do you get 200 milligrams on the Sunday evening just coming back? It's very hard. So what we're doing in, in, in uh, Rhode Island is we are empowering pharmacists over the, to give doxycycline 200 milligrams over the counter. I recommend you try to get your state legislature to do that as well. It's not, not you know, it's a, it's a very safe drug. It's very effective. If you want, you know, you factor in that three percent, you really can't stand to wait and look at the rat, the, the tick bite every every half hour to see if the rash is coming. Some people are very nervous about that. Okay. Um, so I think that is all. So thank you for your patience and any questions. Thank you.